Welcome to the Snyder Cut Rebel Moon Review. We will be covering part one, Chalice of Blood, and part two, Curse of Forgiveness, all in one major review. I'm gonna try and do you and me a favor by not repeating any of my PG-13 critiques. So if you wanna know what I thought of the original two Rebel Moons, I have the part one review here and the part two review here. They are not an alternate universe version of the story the way Zack Snyder claimed. They're definitely director's cuts. And since Netflix gave Snyder ultimate creative freedom from the start, their unnecessary director's cuts questions the whole business model of releasing a wide PG-13 movie that's like the quote-unquote lesser of two, and then holding back this R version hoping that people will come back for seconds on the series. This breakdown is going to have full spoilers in it, but if you're just wondering whether or not it's worth your time to watch the R version, probably not unless you're a Zack Snyder super fan, and specifically the kind of fan that's really interested in picking apart his whole history of filmography and looking for overarching themes and motifs within it. And if you were wondering, part one, Chalice of Blood is much better than part two, The Curse of Forgiveness. This is still a Star Wars wannabe clone with like a grim, dark, edgy element. And the ways it's similar and different to Star Wars feels good to me. Like there's a good balance about the things that I enjoy in Star Wars, the things I think you could have expanded upon in that universe, and like its own unique twist. And I saw a couple direct one-to-one -one like homages, and I do think that Snyder's signature style makes everything different enough to make it an homage instead of a ripoff. So like Kai taking off from Velt felt very Millennium Falcon coded to me. The Jimmy robot and their connection to the princess felt very similar to the original droids in Star Wars Episode 4 and their connection to Princess Leia. The presentation of Velt as a planet as a whole feels very Tatooine coded. And then we add in like this weird mother world red cloaked kind of religion homage to the princess. And this does have some similarities to like the Jedi spirituality religion light side, dark side kind of feel to it. This movie also has a very strong Lord of the Rings kind of vibe going on. Partially this comes from the orchestral music, and partially it comes from very cinematic shooting. But the idea of a single, intense, large-scale battle is within Lord of the Rings, and we can see it here in Rebel Moon too. Velt somehow manages to encompass the feelings I got from like both the Shire and Helm's Deep and the Battle of Gondor, all sort of like wrapped together in this single fight. The characters in both Lord of the Rings and in Rebel Moon at their core are very simplistic archetypes and they're both trying to instill this like noble warrior, slightly playful element into battle. And also there's like this feeling about how like allies are coming in and cleaning everything up in Lord of the Rings and you can sort of see some of the same elements here in Rebel Moon. There's more emotion in Lord of the Rings than there is here in Rebel Moon, but if you're looking at it from like an aesthetic, a lot in common. Also, I am personally digging this solar punk element you can sort of see hiding in the background of Rebel Moon. I've personally watched, listened to, and read a lot of criticism regarding how uncreative the sets are and how we're just taking like ancient civilizations and recreating them in space when we should have been doing something like futuristic, high tech, could have literally been anything. I have also heard a lot of feedback from fans being like, I can't believe they're still doing that by hand. Why haven't they modernized, updated that, and automated it? And in the PG-13 movie, I felt like this was pretty valid, but in the R movie, we have larger context. And we do get to see little hints of things like automated doors or tablets being used. Other little little hints of technology along the fringes of these seemingly like ancient-esque civilizations. I read this a couple of ways. First of all, I thought like we're trying to embody a certain feel and style and it was perfectly encapsulated in this time period so we're harkening back to that imagery we're all familiar with. But on top of that, I felt like sometimes it was a decision for the civilization itself. Like instead of being so busy wondering whether or not they could, they never thought about whether they should should. This is a civilization that really like honed in on what was important to them, what they valued, what they needed or didn't need, what would really actually be a major improvement to them, and incorporating those things that would be helping them without just going techno crazy all over the place. And that embodies a lot of 
solar punk aesthetic because it's not just about being in the future, being successful and thriving. It's like, well, do we really need flying cars? Do we really need to automate this system? Or is it better if we go person by person? What would I use that time for? Would automating in this way have negative impacts on the environment? It feels like they asked these questions, came to a conclusion and made decisions based off of that. But even like with the mother world where we have the guys shoveling in the remains of the dead directly into the collie and fueling it, it's pretty obvious why they wouldn't have a conveyor belt system, at least to me. The mother world is a punitive horror show planet and these people are being punished. They're either like captured slaves or they're like entry level into the military and this is part of them doing their time and showing their worth. Them suffering and having to do this physical labor is the point. Of course they could automate it, but why would they? Some of the other technology we see has consequences and implications to it. Like I really appreciate that the light sword heats up and burns hands if you're not appropriately insulated from it. Hypothetically, all technology in this world is double-edged and you have to weigh the pros and cons before you agree to take it on. And I still think we have really interesting sets and places because this is like a repeat of all the sets and places I've seen before. I'm getting less curious and less interested about them as time goes on. But Velt, especially the addition of like these extra little techno bits has really grown on me as a place. And I'm beginning to fall in love with it in a way I think you can similarly see when Snyder speaks about it in interviews. And I was so pumped to see my speculation about the potential for sentient ships come to fruition. This all in its own kind of makes watching the R version worth it to me because I had a whole side tangent in Rebel Moon Part 2 about this and seeing it built on and expanded upon made me really happy, especially because I think this element is going to be connected to the princess and to the robots and this like triad is going to be the foundation of our resistance in the mother world. Also, I just happen to notice all happy memories seem to happen in the snow. Like we get this new 19 minute intro at the top of Rebel Moon 1 and Eris, the private, is given this opportunity to either kill his father and spare his parents or have everyone die in front of him. And when he's trying to make that decision, and there's a bunch of flashbacks to him, his mom, and his sisters playing in the snow. Likewise, Cora has a bunch of flashbacks with the princess, and all of her like happy memories and witnessing the princess do miraculous things happens in the winter and the snow time too. I don't know exactly how this is going to play in because Belisarius, when he meets with Atticus Noble, also meets in an ice winter world, and he does say something like kind of offhand, like enjoying the cool weather. It does make me wonder if the mother world values icy coldness, and I still love character design here. Some of the extended scenes give more context for clothing, apparel, and choices they would have made. There is a lot of storytelling that happens through world and utility and like little background shots here. And I love the camera work. I'm a huge fan of the Zack Snyder slow-mo. I really can't get enough. I know people keep complaining that there's too much here in Rebel Moon. I have not really felt that way. I also like the selective focus of the camera work. I like the limited zooms. I like the slow pans making me wonder like why are we focusing on this? What does this mean? Is there hidden meaning or something else going on? Like that kind of jump starts my brain into thinking in a way that I enjoy. Notably in this movie there was like an infamous scene in Rebel Moon Part 1 where the camera was out of focus and they left that in the final cut. It is still here in the R version. I don't know what happened here but it really does look like it's out of focus and not done in an intentional kind of way. Also I love the music. An original orchestral soundtrack created for these movies is the way to go. That's what I like in my movies. And this music is doing a lot of work. In part two, it felt a little bit unearned, a little over the top sometimes to me, but especially here in part one, I was really, really digging it. Snyder often goes very high drama with his works, and sometimes I feel like it's out of place. Like I had a hard time with the Wonder Woman theme song in Justice League. But in this case, like I thought all of his music choices worked out really well. I really enjoyed it. I thought it played well with the action. I was just having a good time time like experiencing the music and the scenery together. And I am a huge, huge fan of the new opening here in part one. 19 minutes of Atticus Noble invading a planet where the blood axes have just fled from. He does some messed up junk to the rulers of this world and eventually steals their son away and makes him part of the army. And he is the private heiress we see in Velt. 
I would never in a million years have assumed that this one random private was the guy we were gonna get like extra information. I never mentioned him in my previous reviews because he's just not that important and probably would never have mentioned him. And the reason I like this even though it feels like a super random inclusion and it forces the emphasis on some character who just isn't that important because I do think thematically this opening sets the tone and tells us what Rebel Moon is supposed to be about in a way that I got little little snippets of here and there in the PG-13 movie, but didn't ever feel like I had a unified manifesto at the end. Some of the extra core growing up stuff was really appreciated. I loved getting to see her grow up on the dreadnought, that like kind of isolation, that fear, that uncertainty, lonely childhood was really good. It didn't do a lot to help me understand how she bonded with Belisarius, why she trusted him, why she chose him over other things she could have done, but at least there was time with the two of them on screen and that sort of like helped contextualize some things some of the way for me. The red suit religion, I know it was over the top, but I love that they're just wandering around with a picture of the fallen princess and like a bunch of teeth that they've collected from enemies they've slain. And every time they kill a leader, they like take one of his teeth and like hammer it in with some prayers or whatever. It's weird, it's goofy, it's over the top, it's awesome. And it invites some questions. What happens if they fill up the tooth wall before before they're done with their enemies. Does every ship have these guys with their own separate tooth wall going on? I know why people don't like it, but for me personally, it's the kind of like little weird, creepy thing that feels like extra world building instead of a weird, creepy thing that just feels random. And lastly, I think that the R version is a really wonderful addition to Zack Snyder's filmography and like some of the theories you can connect across his films. I don't have the time to go into every film and break apart how some of these elements have echoes in his other movies. But if you look at Lady Genevieve's Women of Zack Snyder filmography, that could be a great jumping off point. I'm also pretty fond of Princess Week's missed potential of Sucker Punch. But if we're gonna talk about like these larger than life, mythic, superhero beings that Zack Snyder seems to like to focus on, I think Rebel Moon is like the epitome of it. The movie, the plot, the characters, they all have this sense of futility about them. Them. The world is large, the course has been set, even those who are rebelling are like hastening its demise. Get a really good up close ugly look at this when we see the destruction the mother world is wreaking on this one planet the rebels were sheltering in. And the fact that the rebels willingly sacrificed an entire planet so that their little fleet of whoever can just keep going around doing nothing it says to me that even the rebels themselves in this movie are like complicit and like obviously you can't control what other people do so I'm not saying the rebels are solely responsible for the destruction of this first planet in the intro. They do continue to shelter from planet to planet across the galaxy knowing that the mother world is tracking them down and when they get there they're going to kill an entire planet. They are valuing their cause, their lives, and their symbol above the actual reality of people living day to day. Darren where he talks about standing for the principles they believe in instead of hiding behind them suddenly makes a whole lot more sense. And his noble sacrifice suddenly has like weight and meaning because he's talking about doing something different than they've done before, breaking out from the destructive cycle that they've become complicit in, and maybe actually bringing the fight to the mother world and actually changing things for once. Part of the thrust of this story is talking about like it's not enough just to stand against evil. You have to do it in an effective manner and you have to find a way that might be unique or out of the box or self-sacrificial to actually make the change you want or to at least interrupt the pattern of things that you don't want to be happening. And just saying you don't like something is not enough to wash your hands clean of the result if you're participating in some way. And then in a personal sphere, I really think this movie is like a close-up examination of toxic masculinity. And I think this is established best in the opening of Chalice of Blood. Atticus Noble picks the son of the rebelling world leader and gives him the quote-unquote opportunity 
opportunity to get his mother and sister spared and to save his own life if he takes this stick and brutally beats in his father's skull. What's interesting about this moment to me is Eris' father encourages him to go through with this brutal act as well. The dissenting voice here is actually Eris' mother who tries to like appeal to his humanity and encourage that part of him that's already saying no with horror that he cannot do this. It ends up becoming a dichotomy for the soul of this one child. Stereotypical toxic male role versus like an appeal to his humanity and internal goodness in a way that is often considered feminine. I realize gender is a construct, I realize these roles are sociologically driven, and I think the movie knows that too because while we establish this with like um, traditional he-man man and a traditional feminine woman uh, outlining these two different sides, we can see different characters of different genders taking on these roles in the film if we're going to break it down and analyze it from this lens. It's not just a toxic masculinity, it's also ableist and racist as everyone besides Cora and General Titus appear to be young, healthy, white males. Let me know in those comments down below if you saw or have like a picture of someone working for the mother world besides Cora and General Titus who are not white and are not male. And where Eris was able to resist Noble's call for brutal graphic violence, he's not able to deny his father in the same way and eventually he succumbs to the pressure and beats his dad to death in front of his mother and sister. He walks off stage presumably to join the military and Atticus Noble doesn't hold to his promise and kills the mother and daughters. Which like if we're talking about like positive male roles, they're supposed to be using their strength and capacity for violence to like protect and nurture. Murdering his father, this was ideally an act that would protect his sisters and his mother, but Noble ends up perverting even that by murdering them after he's left. And personally I think the scene is kind of trying to tell us that like stepping up and being a man is about more than just a show of strength. It's about making good choices and it's about knowing when you've been backed into a corner and there's nothing but harmful options in front of you, you're no longer embodying that positive masculine energy. And it's quite possible that if you choose a violent path Path to like quote unquote save the others, you've transformed from the man and into the monster. And in Chalice of Blood, I often found myself thinking of Eris's mother, how she begged her son not to kill their father, how she wanted them all to die together, how she knew on some level that there was no way out for her and her daughters, and I wonder if she thought all of them were gonna die, if Eris was going to survive and just be left alone haunted by this evil deed he'd done. If she were alive, what would she think of her son now? What would she think of the redemption arc he's given here in Chalice of Blood? I've still got issues with all of the characters in the movie, starting with the bad guys. There are some clarifying extended scenes regarding the mother world, the king, the rulership, who might be good or bad. Ultimately, when you step back and look at it, it's very confusing. The king is trying to do the right thing because of the princess, but before he either was too ignorant to do that or he didn't care to, or maybe he even knew what was going on and was like co-signing it. So like the monarchy is is bad but also the monarchy is good because the princess is good. It just doesn't work. And also I found it very confusing how this mother world had thrived and prospered. They are cartoonishly evil and backstabbing, so I just don't understand how they control resources, supply trades, own whole worlds, and the more history and lore you give me, the more clear it is that none of this makes any sense. We also get more time with Belisarius as told through flashbacks with Korra, and I have no better sense of him, why he went ahead and adopted Korra, why he betrayed Korra. I get why he killed the king, sort of, kind of, not really, because it seems like even with the princess in charge instead of the king, he could have still ruled in the senate. He still would have had power and lived a good life. The only excuse I can think of is if he really believed that the princess was going to murder all the generals. But like, if the princess is as good and life-saving as Korra portrays her, it seems like she is unlikely 
likely to murder all the generals when she takes over. She's just more likely to retire them and give them things they want instead of hunting and killing people. Which moves us into Korra. Her dialogue and her characterization flow a little bit better in some of these extended scenes. And they added some backstory on why Korra might go ahead and kill Issa and it becomes like a kill her or be killed kind of story. Doesn't make a lot of sense when we also get to hear about how Issa considers her a friend. With Gunner we got to add this scene in the beginning of Velt where he's sort of like secret Really looking at and admiring Korra, which kind of sets up this lingering undercurrent of chemistry between the two of them to help build their romance later on. The added sex scene between Gutter and Korra, especially as compared to the sex scene between Den and Korra, helps showing the two have intimacy, even if you're not feeling it in the dialogue or in their one-to-one -one interactions otherwise. Because like, Korra seems so disassociated with Den, and also Den goes from being like kind of a macho, capable bad badass to being kind of fumbling and uh, not very competent. And then when we move in to the scene in the next movie with Korra and Gunner, it's like a lot of eye contact, a lot of personal connection, and it seems like the two of them are on the same page and moving together in a way that we didn't see in the first scene. Made the relationship feel more real. Ares gives us that whole intro scene. He is the only one spitting real true facts about the Dredna and whether or not they can successfully take down this thing with six extra people. People. He's wrong because we're supposed to believe that somehow the power of friendship and magic and wanting it makes this work out. But I guess I appreciate at least someone saying that like six people against an army is not going to make the difference. We get to deal with the robot Jimmy and man is he a moody dramatic little bitch. I hate him. He was so interesting in the PG-13 movie and I thought there had to be something going on, something interesting, something worth seeing. And when we get here all of his extended scenes, his interactions, his thought process, and it all sucks. I hate this robot if it wasn't for the trifecta of the collies, the princess, and the robot, and this like energy thing it seems like all of them have the colors for. I wouldn't care about him. But I think he's important to the lore, so I guess he needs to stick around. Nemesis's last fight scene is a lot better in this movie than it was in the first one. I don't know why we did her so dirty in the PG-13 cut. We get like a one line from Titus where he explains why he rebelled and it was just kind of a spur of the moment thing and personally I sort of appreciated that it wasn't like this long planned out thing or like this instigating moment that made him decide the mother world was evil he just couldn't carry out this one order this one time and while I appreciate that characterization from him it also really undermines the whole like strategizing general one step ahead of everyone super clever kind of guy he gets the loyalty boost but he loses when it comes to like like cleverness and like tactician points. Other things that were sort of eh was like complicating the plot, adding in the hawkshaws, watching and reporting back to the dreadnought was kind of like a but why. I'm torn about how they switched up the order of a couple things between the PG-13 and the R movie. It says different things. I couldn't tell you right now which one is more effective or if any of it actually matters at all. And overall I'm pretty meh about the extended scenes. There are times these scenes help flow dramatically, but generally they're either purposeless, cool but unneeded, or actually cringe-inducing. The extended scene where Gunner's confused for a prostitute is super cringe. I don't know what the point of the scene was. They weren't funny, they weren't edgy, they weren't interesting. So they're just there being cringy and weird and homophobic and misogynistic and off-putting in a bunch of ways. It taking longer and being more explicit doesn't help that. We get to see the griffin rip the slaver in half midair, I guess good for the griffin, but this actually made me ask more questions questions than it did resolve them because it's like well why doesn't the griffin come with them? What is the griffin going to do now without anyone feeding it? It looks like it's on this isolated desert world. Can it even survive? Perhaps most importantly why doesn't Korra just shoot the slaver in the head from the start and take Tarek and leave? I always love more Nemesis time. I think she steals all of the scene she's in. But even all of that said the ramen shop stuff was not really necessary and the extended walking to see the spider woman scene was too long and it was cringe and it was often awkward and not even visually that interesting. Also the addition in the spider woman scene of her 
slicing, the spider woman's abdomen open, and the babies coming out. The babies were really cool looking, but it asks more questions than it answers because the spider woman took that kid as revenge since her children were no longer viable. But apparently they're all just walking around fine, which means she was gonna have kids and it was going to be fine. So was she lying? Did she not know that? Are all of these little spiderlings going to be left to die? Has Nemesis killed their mom and doomed hundreds of children? Like what is the deal here? I hate how Titus joins the group. I think the extended scene makes it even worse. Especially because Cora and Titus are like talking to each other, sort of like Cora convincing Titus to come along and more or less saying that she shares his pain or whatever. And while she's doing this, we just get cutbacks of like all the other characters staring at them and watching this interplay, which makes the conversation even more stilted and awkward feeling. It really feels like they're bad actors in a traditional Greek play and we have like an audience sitting and staring at them a little too close. Arguably to me, the extended harvest scene stuff in the R movie is worse than what we got in the PG 13 cut. The exposition and dialogue here is just as excruciating as ever. Sometimes the flow is better, sometimes the added context makes the word soup make sense, but a lot of the time it's still just soupy nonsense. There's a ton of repetitive moments where they are telling us these characters' backstories in one-line pieces. We hear about Tarek's backstory on four separate occasions before we get to a flashback. And I remember complaining in the PG-13 version that none of these characters interacted once they joined the party. Uh, we get a little bit of interaction here, it's really bad. Preferable they don't interact apparently. There's also a lot of really weird and pointless scenes. Pretty much everything I called out as weird and pointless in the first two reviews still stands. And now we have a bunch of extended scenes that didn't need to be there as well. The story lacks emotional investment. I felt a little bit more this time than I felt in the original movie. And a lot of those feelings were unearned and like sort of manipulated out of me through some of the stylized visual and music work going on. And I think lastly, I'm not confident this R movie on its own stands alone as a movie. Like obviously I watched the PG-13 movies first. I had a ton of context coming into this. And I had reset my expectations based off of that experience. More or less had a list of things I wanted explained or handled in these R movies. This movie on its own did not have to establish anything though. Not confident without the context of the PG-13 movies it would have effectively done that. This is apparently Rebel Moon as it's intended. So despite its flaws, did I like it? Honestly, I think this series has a very rocky start, but it does have my attention. I'm so curious about that sentient ship. I'm curious about why everyone keeps forgiving Korra. And in particular, in the last like shot of the movie, we go back to Belisarius, and there's this stained glass of a woman warrior above him. And I don't know if we're meant to think that that's Isa, but I'm actually thinking that might be like some kind of foretelling of Korra or maybe Korra is embodying that hero because the mural has brown hair and Korra has brown hair and the sword is prevalent and Korra is a warrior and if like in some way shape or form this warrior woman element is needed to bring Isa into her power and into a new and better reign maybe both of them are prophesized which like I'm not in love with a prophecy style movie but like I want some kind of story, some kind of something that kind of like ties all of this together and makes it mean something. And really this whole like Rebel Moon saga experiment thing has me deep in the Snyder lore. And despite Rebel Moon being a riff on Star Wars, it is in its own right its own thing. And I would love to give something that is its own thing a chance, despite a rocky start, despite a poor marketing strategy, despite a poor release strategy. I still think there's something here that could be salvaged. That said, patience isn't my virtue, but I'm definitely not watching any more PG-13 varieties of any of these movies. I will be waiting for R cuts and watching only those from now on. That way I can report back to you about whether or not the R version stands on its own. Have you watched Rebel Moon, the PG-13 version, or the R version? And if so, what did you think? Tell me all about it in those comments down below. And as always, keep reading.